the pretrial chamber of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Noting the significant public interest in the proceedings and the need for members of the public without legal training to understand and appreciate the meaning of its decision and writing in the style reflecting their need hereby decides as follows. Uh, the public has a lot of interest in the proceedings of the extraordinary chamber in the courts of Cambodia. So uh, our judgment is written in the form that uh, reflects uh, this need. Hereby decides as follows. One, introduction. One. The pretrial chamber refers to repeat and adopts the report of examination, the report dated 19 November 2007, on the proceedings, legal provisions, and the facts at issue in this case, which forms part of this decision and is annexed here too. Two, on the 15th of November 2007 and the 20th of November 2007 and 21st November 2007, the pretrial chamber held hearings partially in uh, camera and partly in public. Three, before the hearings, the pretrial chamber received the case file, which was updated. Two, admissibility of the appeal. Four, on the 23rd of August 2007, the co-lawyers of the child person filed a notification of appeal. By order of the chief, of Greffiers dated the f on the 4th of September, the pretrial chamber allowed the co-lawyers to file their pleadings within 15 days after receiving the notification of that order. The appeal brief was filed on the 5th of September 2007. The appeal brief was filed within the time limit set by the pretrial chamber and is therefore admissible. Five, the co-prosecutors invited the pretrial chambers to clarify whether the 30-day limit, uh, time limit in Rule 75 of the internal rules of the ECCC is a time limit to file substantive appeals or merely notices of appeal. Unless there is a need to clarify the rules because of the arguments of the parties and the consequences this might bear the pretrial chamber does not clarify rules in general. In this particular case, any ambiguity in the rule was overridden when the pretrial chamber accepted the notice of the appeal. Three the nature of the appeal. Six, the de decision of the co-investigating judges on provision or detention is given pursuant to Rule 63.2 of the internal rules from which an appeal may be made 
according to Internal Rules 63.4, to the pretrial chamber. The nature of this appeal is not defined in the internal rules. The pretrial chamber has, therefore, to determine the scope of its review of the provisional detention and if it is bound in its considerations by the grounds in the pleadings of the appellant. Seven, in the agreement between the United Nations and the Royal Government of Cambodia concerning the prosecution under Cambodian law of crimes committed during the period of Democratic Cambodia of 6 June 2003 and the law on the establishment of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia of 27 October 2004, there is no direct provision for appeal against orders of provisional detention from the co-investigating judges. Article 12.1 of the agreement specifically provides that the procedure shall be in accordance with the Cambodian law. The internal rules specifically make provision for the right of appeal in respect of provisional detention orders, knowing that the Cambodian Code of Criminal Procedure made such provision with regards to La Chambre d'Instruction. Uh, the pretrial chamber fulfills this role in the ECCC. Therefore, the manner in which the pretrial chamber must approach appeals on provisional detention orders is directed by Livre 4, uh, La Dantrusion, uh, uh, 2, La Chambre d'Instruction. Article 261, the interpreter would like to t uh, turn your attention to listen to Channel 3 in French because the English version is not available. The French version would be uh, read in Channel 3. It's reading the internal rules in relation to these articles of the Cambodian Code of Criminal Procedure, the pretrial chamber is directed to review the provisional detention order by examination of A, the procedures of the co-investigating judges prior to the order being issued, B, the exercise of the discretion by the co-investigating judges leading to the consideration of utilizing internal rule 63.3. C, the sufficiency of the facts for reaching the conclusion under 63.3 of the internal rules. D, whether the circumstances on which the order was based still exist today. And E, any additional issues not otherwise dealt with 
which are the subject of specific grounds of appeal. Four, examination of the procedures of the co-investigating judges prior to the order being issued. Nine, the pretrial chamber has examined whether the co-investigating judges have reminded the charged person of his right to remain silent at every stage of the proceedings as prescribed in Internal Rules 21.1D, which provides every person suspected or prosecuted shall be presumed innocent as long as his or her guilt has not been established. Any such person has the right to be informed of any charges brought against him or her to be defended by a lawyer of his or her choice and at every stage of the proceedings will be informed of his or her right to remain silent. 10. It is apparent that the charged person was only informed of his right to remain silent at the commencement of the initial hearing he attended. He has not been informed of this right prior to the adversarial hearing or during any interviews. This matter would have raised an issue as to what is meant by the phrase at every stage of the proceedings shall be informed of his right to remain silent. Uh, had the co-lawyers for the charged person not advised the court following questions posed in the hearing of the pretrial chamber that they consider that this rule has been complied with by the co-investigating judges as the charged person was reminded of this right during the initial hearing of the co-investigating judges, which is the commencement of an investigative stage. The co-lawyers were present during each hearing and interview of the charged person, and the charged person was aware of his right to remain silent during each hearing and interview. The pretrial chamber notes that the charged person used this right during his hearings and interviews, and that the charged person also voluntarily delivered written statements to the co-investigating judges. Following questions asked by the pretrial chamber, the co-lawyers also made clear that they will not request annulment of the proceedings related to this issue, considering their before mentioned position on this matter. We therefore find that any procedural defect in this respect has been veiled by the charged person. Given these circumstances, the pretrial chamber considers it of no further interest to rule on the issue of the meaning of the words at every stage of the proceedings shall be informed of his right to remain silent in Internal Rule 21.1D. 11. The pretrial chamber has further examined whether the charged person was defended by a lawyer of his choice as prescribed in Internal Rule 21.1D. In the records of the co-investigating judges, the charged person made it clear that he wanted the assistance of an international lawyer as well as national lawyer as prescribed in Internal Rule 22. Although it was not clear from the record of the adversarial hearing, the co-lawyers and the co-prosecutors made clear to the pretrial chamber that the internal, sorry, the international lawyer was present and that he was allowed to defend the charged person through the national lawyer and that therefore the right of the charged person was complied with 
and no objection to the um, contrary was made. Contrary was, was made. Excuse me. Twelve. The pretrial chamber concludes, given the concessions uh, of the co-lawyers, there is no need to consider this matter further. Five. The exercise of the discretion by the co-investigating judges leading to the consideration of the utilizing of internal rule 63.3. 13. The co-lawyers set out in their appeal brief their arguments as to why the more than eight years prior detention violated both the relevant provisions of Cambodian law and applicable human rights law, Article 9 of the ICCPR. With reference to the jurisprudence related to the abuse of process doctrine, the co-lawyers submitted that this period of prior detention may be imputed to the judicial authorities responsible for the present case. In effect, they submit that such prior detention was a bar to the exercise of a discretion in internal uh, rule 63.3 to consider the issue of the provisional detention order with respect to proceedings before the ECCC. The co-prosecutors opposed these arguments as set out in the report. In their decision, the co-investigating judges considered they had no jurisdiction to determine the legality of the charged person's prior detention. The pretrial chamber finds it appropriate to examine this matter, noting that it is a specific ground of appeal. 14. Article 9 of the ICCPR reads, 1. Everyone has the right to liberty and security of person. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest or detention. No one shall be deprived of his liberty except on such grounds and in accordance with the such procedures as uh, are established by law. Two, anyone who is arrested shall be informed at the time of his arrest of the reasons for his arrest and shall be promptly informed of any charges against him. Three, anyone arrested or detained on a criminal charge shall be brought promptly before a judge or other official authorized by the law to exercise judicial power and shall be entitled to trial within a reasonable time or to release. It shall not be a general rule that persons awaiting trial shall be detained in custody, but Release may be subject to guarantees to appear for trial at any other stage of the judicial proceedings. And should uh, occasions rise for execution of the judgment. Four, anyone who is deprived of their uh, his or her liberty by arrest or detention shall be entitled to take proceedings before a court in order that the uh, court may uh, decide without delay on the lawfulness of his detention and order his release if the detention is not lawful. 15. The question is whether previous actions by other than uh, ECCC judicial authorities have caused a violation of the above mentioned article entailing consequences for decisions taken by organs 
of the ECCC, such as the co-investigating judges and the pretrial chamber itself. The pretrial chamber is of the view that it can only take a violation of this article into account when the organ responsible for the violation was connected to an organ of the ECCC or had been acting on behalf of any organ of the ECCC or in uh, concert uh, with organs of the ECCC. 16. The question of the relationship between the ECCC and the military court is therefore relevant to a consideration of whether the co-investigating judges and the pretrial chamber have any jurisdiction to inquire into the legality of the prior detention. 17. According to and as provided in the internal rules, the co-investigating judges have jurisdiction to decide on provisional detention and release, and the pretrial chamber has jurisdiction to decide on appeals against these decisions. The agreement the ECC law, the internal rules, and Cambodian law do not explicitly or implicitly give any jurisdiction to the co-investigating judges or the pretrial chamber to rule upon any matter related to decisions or actions of the investigating judges of the military court or any other court within the Cambodian uh, court system. The jurisdiction of the pretrial chamber and other organs of the ECCC is expressly limited to the subject matter of the ECC law. There is no provision for interaction between the ECCC and any other judicial bodies within the Cambodian court structure. 18. The ECCC is distinct from other Cambodian courts in a number of respects. The judiciary includes both national and foreign judges. The foreign judges would not normally qualify for appointment within the Cambodian court structure as they have no general training in Cambodian law. But rather are chosen for their experience in criminal law or international law, including international humanita humanitarian law and human rights law. The ECCC is entirely self-contained from the commencement of an investigation through the determination of appeals. There is no right to have any decision of the ECCC reviewed by court outside its structure. And equally, there is no right for any of its chambers to review decisions outside the ECCC. In the structure of the Cambodian criminal courts, appeals from the military court may be made to the appeals court and from there to the Supreme Court. Nineteen. For all practical and legal purposes, the ECCC is 
and operates as an independent entity within the Cambodian court structure and uh, therefore has no jurisdiction to judge the activities of other bodies. The co-prosecutors have submitted that uh, this independence which makes the ECCC a special internationalized tribunal is demonstrated by a number of factors that are summarized in the report. 20. In reaching its conclusion, the pretrial chamber has also referred to the decision of the appeals chamber of the special court of Sierra, Sierra Leone in the case of Tyler, where it considered the indicia of an international court as including the fact that the court is established by treaty, that it was an expression uh, of the will of the international community that is to, uh, or that is considered part of the machinery of international justice and that its jurisdiction involves trying the most serious inter international crimes. 21. As the ECCC has no direct uh, relationship to the military court, it has no direct jurisdiction to review the actions of that court or the compliance of these actions with the Cambodian law. There is similarly no evidence that uh, the military court acted on behalf of the ECCC in detaining the charged person or of any concerted action between any organ of the ECCC and the military court. The court lawyers for the charged person produced at the hearing of the pretrial chamber one document from the case file which is said to have uh, emanated from the military court. The way in which this document came onto the case file has not been disclosed and on its face does not provide any proof of a link between the ECCC and the military court or demonstrate that the military court and the ECCC acted in concert in any way whatsoever in detaining the charged person for the whole or any part of the period in exercise of eight years, uh, sorry, in excess of eight years. 22, in fact, the ECCC only existed in any form after the swearing in of the judges of the ECCC, which took place on the 3rd of July, 2006. The ECCC did not exist as an organ before this date. The first task of the judges was to uh, formulate the internal rules on which basis the uh, prosecutions could take place. These rules were adopted in the plenary meeting of judges on uh, 12 of June 2007. Thus, there cannot have been any connection or any actions on behalf of any organ of the ECCC by the authorities of the military uh, record prior to these dates. To the extent that the military court purported to base certain actions on the pre-amendment and amended ECCC law, this cannot have been at the direction of uh, the ECCC.
23, the pretrial chamber finds on the basis of the above reasoning that the co-investigating judges could use their discretion of utilizing internal rule 63.3 as they did. 24, the pretrial chamber further observes that the co-investigating judges and co-prosecutors of the ECCC have acted in accordance with Article 9 of the ICCPR and it notices that the co-lawyers did not argue that the co-investigating judges violated this article themselves. 25. The pretrial chamber further observes that the trial chamber and the Supreme Court chamber may determine as submitted by the co-prosecutors that it is appropriate to take any previous provisional detention whether or not it was illegal into account at a later stage of the proceedings. The pretrial chamber notes that the maximum sentence for the crimes with which the charged person is spec uh, suspected is life imprisonment and that the charged person has thus far not contested the allegations made against him. The release from provisional detention due to the mere fact of the length of such detention should only be considered when it would clearly exceed any likely sentence that may be given. Six, examination of the conditions which have to be met according to Rule 63.3 of the Internal Rules. 26, Rule 63.3 of the Internal Rules provides the co-investigating judges may order the provisional detention of the charged person only where the following conditions are met. A. There is well-founded reason to believe that the person may have committed the crime or crimes specified in the introductory or supplementary submission. And B. The co-investigating judges consider provisional deten detention to be a necessary measure to 1. Prevent the charged person from exerting pressure on any witnesses or victims or prevent any collusion between the charged person and accomplices of crimes falling within the jurisdiction of the ECCC. Two, preserve evidence or prevent the destruction of any evidence. Three, ensure the presence of the charged person during the proceedings. Four, protect the security of the charged person. Or five, preserve public order. 27. In order to decide if the grounds for provisional det detention as set out in Rule 63.3 are met, the pretrial chamber has taken into account the written and oral submissions of both parties, the evidence they have submitted, and the whole case file of the co-investigating judges up to the date of the hearing. Conditions for provisional detention. A. There are well-founded reasons to believe that the charged person may have committed the crimes specified in the introductory submission, Internal Rules 63.3a. 28. The charged person does not contest that he was the deputy or and then the chairman of S21 from 1975 onward. 
At the hearing on the 20th November 2007, his national lawyer, Mr. Kasabut, introduced himself in the hearing of the pretrial chamber as follows. I, Kasabut, the lawyer to defend the charged person named Gang Yu, alias Dutch, who was also the chief of the S21. 29. At any time during the proceeding in appeal, the defense has not challenged the fact that there are well-founded reasons to believe that the charged person may have committed the crimes for which he has been put under investigation by the co-investigating judges, namely that he was directing the security prison, S21, between 1975 and 1979, where under his authority, countless abuses were allegedly committed against the civilian populations, including, in broad terms, mass murder, arbitrary detentions, and torture which occurred within the uh, political context of widespread and systematic abuses and constituted crimes against humanity. B, the provisional detention is a necessary measure. One, to prevent the charged person from exerting pressure on any witnesses or victims and to preserve evidence and prevent the destructions of any evidence according to Internal Rules 63.3b1 and 63.3b2. Third, tiers. these two grounds of provisional detention will be analyzed together since they are supported, they are supported by the same arguments. In fact, the statements made by the witnesses of the event at S21 can be considered as evidence within the meaning of Internal Rule 63.3b2. 31st, as admitted by the charged person himself, S21 was a security center devoted to collecting confessions from detainees, which were sent uh, to the Central Committee of the Party. It is general understanding that many people were killed in this center, and according to the prosecutors, only a few witnesses are left. 32. The surviving witnesses, either inmates or staff, were submitted to a cruel regime of terror. Some of them have expressed publicly that, has expressed uh, publicly their ambiguous feeling of fear while serving as prison guards under the charged person at, at S21. It is foreseeable It is foreseeable that this fear will come back and prevent them from testifying should the charged person be released. In particular context of the event that happened at S21, the mere presence of the charged person in the society can exert pressure on witnesses and prevent them from testifying. 33. In a general way, a survey conducted by the Documentation Center of Cambodia among potential witnesses and official representatives in the Takao province reports that, uh, reports that some potential witnesses have expressed their fear of testifying before the ECCCC based, among other grounds, 
on the fact that they are afraid that their accused persons or their relatives can put pressure on them or seek revenge. This has to be put into the social context prevailing in Cambodia, where measures to protect witnesses may be limited and weapons easily accessible. Therefore, witnesses' willingness to testify is already fragile. And the balance could be easily upset by the release of the charged person. 34. The pretrial chamber notes that the charged person has uttered threats in the past in order to ensure that his activities at S21 not be disclosed. In an interview, a former Khmer Rouge cadre named Chaksim said that during the democratic Cambodia period, the charged person warned him that if he talked to anyone regarding his association with the S21 security center, the charged person would report him to injury to get him killed. This gives an indication that the charged person might utter threats again to intimidate witnesses. 35. It is not contested that the whole case file has now been made available to the charged person, including the names of potential witnesses. The charged person has asserted that he has no reason to interfere with the witnesses, for his lawyer says that all of them have now been interviewed by the co-investigating judges. Even if the witnesses were heard and gave evidence, there is still a chance that they have to be heard later during the further investigations and or court hearings. 36. Moreover, the testimonies of the few witnesses of S21 events are crucial to investigation and eventually to the trial. It is essential that they are not in any fear or suffering from any pressure preventing them from testifying. The pretrial chamber finds that the provisional detention is a necessary measure to uh, prevent the charged person from exerting pressure on witnesses or destroying any evidence. Two, to ensure the presence of the charged person during the proceedings. 37. From 1979 to 1999, when he was arrested by the military court, the charged person disappeared from public view, while all the details of his whereabouts and the names he used remain unclear. Many factors indicate that he took different measures to conceal his past and to avoid being recognized as Dutch the former chairman of S21. From 1986, he used the name of Hong Pen. He changed his job many times. He used to work as a teacher, director of education, and a medical aid worker. After the democratic Cambodia period, he did not return to live in his hometown, but instead moved from one location to another, living notably in a Khmer Rouge control area 
in northwestern Cambodia in some load and in a refugee camp called Ban Ba Muong in Thailand. He wrote false statement in his resume regarding his identity. For instance, uh, for example, that he was born in a Chalik village in Kampung Thom and that his mother was dead. And he did not visit his family between 1979 and 1996. So his mother even believed that he was dead. 38. In April 1999, the charged person was discovered by two journalists in some low district. When the story of his discovery and confession was made public, he disappeared. 39. Now, facing the possibility of being sentenced for life imprisonment, there is a risk that he will disappear again. 40. The mere fact that the charged person's lawyer alleged that he does not have a passport and that he and his family are poor will not prevent him from attempting to flee if he were to be released. Or he could always hide himself in Cambodia as he did before or even cross border illegally. 41. Therefore, the pretrial chamber finds that the provisional detention is a necessary measure to ensure the presence of the charged person during the proceedings. 3. To protect the securities of the charged person according to internal rules 63.3b.4. 42. Seeing his discoveries by journalists in 1999, the charged person has given many interviews to journalists and to a representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights regarding his activities in Democratic Cambodia and has confirmed his position as chairman of S21 Security Center. He told journalists that he was ready to expose the other leaders of the regimes. And he has given many details about the organization of the said regimes, notably by identifying some of the senior leaders and stating their roles. 43. The threat to the charged person's safety comes from the victims and their relatives and members of the staff working for him at the S21. Now, the charged person has admitted that he was the chairman of S21, where thousands of inmates were tortured before being executed by the cruelest means, the victims and their relatives could be tempted to seek revenge. They have been waiting for justice for more than 30 years and their reactions could be one of violence if they were to learn that the charged person has been released and given, given liberty even if such liberty might be temporary. 44. The charged person's lawyer has asserted that he was at liberty between 1979 to 19, from 1979 to 1999, and that no threat was made to his safety. Once he was discovered by journalists, the charged person himself clearly expressed his fear for his safety. 
journalist Ned Taylor has quoted the charged person in an article entitled I am in danger as follows I don't want any man to know about our relationship he told the review they will make me unsafe I have no secrets from the Far Eastern Economic Review but I fear the people around me I don't know who is the man of Nianjie, who is the man of Samok, and who is the man of Pisampon. I am in danger. My life is at risk. They can kill me. 45. In another article released the same day, Ned Taylor reported now that his past has been revealed Deutsch clearly fears for his life he sometimes spoke only in whispers referring to Khmer Rouge leaders by their initials so that any listeners would not recognize their names at other times, he asked to be driven to a remote area to speak in a vehicle where he couldn't be overheard. 46. The United Nations and Amnesty International also expressed their concerns about the charged person's safety at that time. Since the interview he was giving exposed crimes committed by Khmer Rouge leaders. Amnesty International issued an urgent action on the 23rd April 1999 in which they mentioned that the charged person may be killed to stop him testifying against others involved in the crimes against humanity. Forty-seven. The pre-trial chamber finds no relevant information that the threat to the charged person's safety has diminished with time. Now that the charged person's identity has been made public, his safety is more at risk than ever. 48. Because of the nature of this decision, exercise of common sense is appropriate. The pretrial chamber considers that the provisional detention is a necessary measure to protect the charged person's safety. 4. To pre preserve public order according to uh, uh, Internal Rule 63.3b.5. 49. It is estimated that 1.7 million Cambodians died during the three years, eight months, and 20 days that the democratic Cambodia regimes ruled the country. These were approximately one quarter of the population at the time. A large portion of today's Cambodian population has not only been personally subject to the harsh regimes imposed by the Khmer Rouge, but has also lost one or more of their relatives and friends. 50. Contrary to what the charged person's lawyer has said, it appears to the pretrial chamber that the passage of time has not diminished the impact 
of the democratic Cambodia regime on society. It is widely accepted that a majority of the population that lived through the period from 1975 to 1979 suffers from post traumatic stress disorders. Specialists believe that the commencement of judicial activities before the ECCC may pose a fresh risk to the Cambodian society. It may lead to the resurfacing of anxieties and arise in the negative social consequences that may accompany them. 51. The General Assembly of the United Nations has recognized that the crimes committed during the Democratic Kampuchea period from 1975 to 1979 is still a matter of concern for Cambodian society, even for humanity. Recalling that the serious violations of Cambodian and international law during the period of democratic Kampuchea from 1975 to 1979 continues to be matters of vitally important concern to the international community as a whole. Recognizing that the accountability of individual perpetrators of grave human rights violation is one of the central elements of any effective remedy for victims. 52. The first public hearing of the ECCC held on the 20th and the 21st of November 2007 has endangered a great deal of interest amongst the Cambodian population and the press alike. Hundreds of people, including members of the public, the press, non-governmental organization, and the international community came to attend this hearing this interest is demonstrative of the fact that the trials of those most responsible for the crimes committed during the Kampuchea democratic period from 1975 to 1979 are still a matter of great concern today for the Cambodian population and the international community. 53. The Cambodian people have been waiting for 30 years to have justice, to see an end to impunity, and to see in evidence what happened during this tragic period of their history. 54. Since 1999, the charged person has publicly recognized that he was chairman of S21 Security Center, where thousands of men, women, and children were detained, tortured, and killed. He has been kept in detention since that time. It is expected that he will be brought to trial before the ECCC around June 2008. Therefore, public order will be disturbed if he were to be released now. 55. The defense has argued that when the charged person was at liberty between 1979 and 1999, the public order was not disrupted. The pretrial chamber considers that the situation is completely different today. Now that the charged person's identity is well known, 
And now that he has publicly admitted that he was chairman of S21, and that the process of justice has started, the charged person has been at liberty for only about a month since he was discovered by journalists in 1999 and made his public declarations. There is no reason to rely on the past to assert that public order will not be disrupted if the charged person were to be released because of the different circumstances. 56. Therefore, the pre-trial chamber finds that the provisional detention of the charged person is a necessary measure to preserve public order. 57. On the basis of the above-mentioned reasoning, the pre-trial chamb chamber consider that the co-investigating judges could order the provisional detention and that the grounds are still satisfied. Release on bail. 58. The charged person asked to be released on bail as a remedy in part to the violation of his right to be trialed within a reasonable time. In his defense, the charged person has suggested that he could be put under house arrest. At the hearing, his lawyers have also suggested that the charged person be released under the following conditions. One, the charged person gives his address to the pretrial chamber, and two, the charged person reports to the nearest police office weekly. They also added that the charged person does not have any money or passport, so he cannot go out of the country. 59. The pretrial chamber has found that in the present case, all of the five grounds set out in Rule 63.3 have been met, although any of these would have been sufficient to justify the provisional detention of the charged person. This means that the provisional detention is a necessary measure to ensure the security of the witnesses and the charged person to preserve evidence to ensure the presence of the charged person during the proceeding and to preserve public order. In these circumstances, the pretrial chamber considers that the charged person cannot be released on bail. for any of the conditions proposed by the charged person are overweighed by the necessity for his provisional detention. 60. It is sufficient to say that even if the charged person were to be put under house arrest, there will, be, there will still be high risk to his personal safety. As mentioned before, the charged person will be required to come to the court on different occasions, and it will be very difficult to ensure his safety during the transportation from his house to the court. This reason is sufficient in itself for the pre-trial chamber to reject the charged person's request to be released on bail. 61. Furthermore, the pre-trial chamber is not convinced 
that any bail conditions that the pretrial chamber could impose would ensure the presence of the charged person during the hearing and the protection of others as set out in the Internal Rules 65.1. Application for Reparations 62 In the appeal brief submitted by the co-lawyers of the charged person, in effect, an application subsequent upon a finding that the charged person should either be released due to an illegal detention or that his detention had exceeded all legal limits that in the event of an acquittal financial compensation should be made to Mr. Kang as a reparation for both the eight years plus he has spent in provisional detention and also for the harm he has suffered as a result of the violation of his entitlement to trial within a reasonable time or to release. In the event of a conviction, the eight years he has already served will have to be deducted from the sentence to be served and a further sentence reduction will have to be granted as compensation for the harm he has suffered as a result of the violation of his entitlement to trial within a reasonable time or to release. 63. Given the findings of the pretrial chamber, it is inappropriate for the chamber to make such statements. It would not be appropriate for the pretrial chamber to make the statements requested in any event when another judicial body may well become seized of this case for trial and will have to make its own decisions on the basis of the evidence and the submission made before it. Noting that the charged person and the lawyers are present, the pretrial chamber decide unanimously that one, the appeal is admissible. Two, the co-investigating judges properly exercise their discretion to consider ordering the provisional detention of the charged person. Three, the grounds for provisional detention are satisfied. Four, the application for release are refused. Five, the order of the co-investigating judges is affirmed with the reason expressed in this decision being substituted for the reasons of the co-investigating judges. Six, safeguarded copy of the case file and its corresponding uh, uh, file, case file number shall be sent to the graffiti of the co-investigating judges. Seven, the appeal is dismissed. Eight, in accordance to Rule 77.13 of the Internal Rules, this decision is not subject to appeal. Given in public by the pre-trial pre chamber in Phnom Penh on the 3rd of December 2007, I order the Chief of Security to bring or to take the charged person back to his place. The interpreter would like to make a correction of the misspelled term in the paragraph 52. Uh, the term should have been rendered as engendered, not endangered. So now I would like to announce the adjournment of the hearing. Thanks.